We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to actually begin in Matthew 22. You see, Jesus told a parable about a king who held a wedding feast for his son. All the original invitees to the wedding feast bowed out for one reason or another, giving all manner of excuse. And some even brutalized and killed the servants in this parable who were sent out with the invitations. Now, that's that's a bizarre story to tell if it didn't have such real life application in the prophets, you know, sent by God with invitation to what God was going to do. Well, in Matthew 22, verse 8, Jesus continued in the parable. He said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets. They gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Wow. <laughs> How do you react to a story like that? Severe, serious, and for all its many facets, that particular parable reveals that when it comes to God, there is only one way. There is only one correct approach. The Bible brings us to that place. Our world is filled with all kinds of so-called approaches to God. You have your way, I have my way, and we're all going to eventually get there, which is a lie. There is only one approach to God, one correct way. There is a righteous wedding attire. And you have to be clothed with the righteous wedding attire if you're going to come into the presence of God. Revelation 19 verse 7 tells us what that is. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is, get this, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You do not come into the wedding feast without wearing the proper wedding attire, which is righteousness. But also note in Revelation 19 that it was given to her, which is good news. She doesn't make her wedding dress. No, the bride's clothing, the bride's righteous attire was given to her. Ephesians 5.25 tells us Christ gave himself up for the church so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And Jesus said, I am the way. And the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that way never changes. Because, are you ready? Jesus Christ is the same. And yeah, we're going to do that every single time. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And tonight we're going to talk about that right approach to God. Jesus is the right approach. Jesus is the way. He embodies the approach to God. There is no other way to get to the Father but through the Son. Now, in the last several chapters, he, he's been taking us through. I was telling our staff again this morning that the challenge of teaching through Hebrews is that it's one sermon. And so technically, you're really out to start in verse 1 of chapter 1 and just read it. Because that's how it was written. Now, we take it, and because we need to, we study it through, and we pick it apart, and we look at this Greek word, and that Greek word, and and this message here, and this section there. But he meant it as a sermon. And I'm still really toying with the idea, maybe at the end of this study, of just one night starting in chapter 1, and just, just read it, so we can hear it, how it was intended and originally written. But so far, at least recently, chapters 5 through 7, we talked about the obsolete versus the original priesthood. He covered that area and compared the old with the new covenant. Well, now tonight into chapter 9, we continue with the same type of comparison thinking. And we're going to look at the previous versus the perfect approach to God. The previous versus the perfect. 
Chapter 9, verse 1. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. Regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. The implication is, so does the new covenant. Okay, don't miss that. 613 laws of the Old Testament. And aren't we thankful that that's all done away with and we just don't have to deal with that anymore? No more rules, no more regulations. Hey, hey, we've got grace. Yes, but the wedding attire matters. Regulations are required. God has not changed. He is still light and in him there is no darkness at all. There are yet stipulations that must be met to enter into the divine worship of the heavenly sanctuary. Just as there were regulations for the divine worship of the earthly sanctuary, the earthly tabernacle, there are stipulations for entrance into the heavenly. Now with that in mind, and this idea of correct attire and the appropriate approach to God in our minds and thoughts, we're going to take tonight's study into two or perhaps three parts, depending on how you're doing. Part one, which we'll look at right now, the insufficiency of the earthly sanctuary. The insufficiency of the earthly sanctuary. For there was, verse 2, a tabernacle prepared, an outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. And this is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was the golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat but of these things we cannot now speak in detail anyone see a problem I mean right off the bat in his description of the tabernacle if you've read the whole the Old Testament description in the book of Exodus something's not right so let's walk it through I know we've done this recently, but but if you can picture yourself coming into the tabernacle, I was thinking down in the austere Negev of Israel, the southern desert area in a place called Timnah, which is just outside of Elot, there is an actual full-scale model of the tabernacle. A group of us walked through it a few years ago. Amazing to to actually see and get a sense of of the height and and the width and, and where everything was in the tabernacle. So come with me into it. You walk into the outer courtyard, which is roughly 150 feet long by 75 feet wide and and a, a white linen curtain all the way around held up by by poles. And that white linen curtain is about seven and a half feet or so high. And you come into that outer courtyard area, and the very first thing you see as you walk in is the bronze altar. Big altar of sacrifice, roughly the size of the stage here. And immediately behind the bronze altar, you see the bronze laver, which is a huge bronze bowl for washing, for all the ceremonial washing of the priest going in and out of the rest of the tabernacle. So that's the outer courtyard. Then you come to the actual tabernacle itself. Now, the whole thing was called the tabernacle, but really the tent of meeting was was the inside. When you would then enter into the holy place, and in the holy place, which this tabernacle is about 45 feet in length by 15 feet of width, and you see as you walk in there, and I shared this Sunday, first thing to your left, you see the golden lampstand with seven oil lamps on it, and it's the only light that's provided on the inside of the tabernacle. Then directly in front of you, you you see uh, the altar of incense. And then over to the right, you see the table of showbread. And finally, right behind the altar of incense, you see this beautiful veil. This woven veil of purple and blue and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. And all of this makes up this, this gorgeous thick veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. If you go behind the veil, and I, which we did, which felt a little weird, I got to tell you. I wasn't sure if it was allowed, you know, and we're walking in there, is anything going to happen? And you come in, and there's the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of it, the mercy seat. Our group gathered in that little room, and and it it really was just kind of weird to think about what it must have been like, because the size and everything was accurate, just standing in there. But do you see the problem with what we just read in chapter 9? The pastor seems to place the altar of incense 
in the Holy of Holies. And when I read scripture, I always assumed, I always thought the altar of incense was in the holy place. The only thing in the holy of holies is the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on it, right? But but look again what he says. There's a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table of the sacred bread. This is the holy place. Lampstand on the left, showbread on the right. No altar of incense. He says, behind the second veil, there's a tabernacle called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was. And then it tells the contents of the Ark. Whoa, wait a minute. We have a flaw in scripture, a contradiction, if you will, a problem. You know, when you run across these things, I've told you before, Don't immediately, you know, either assume it's a contradiction or run away from it for fear that you might find out if you dig too far that your Bible's going to fall apart. Because the truth is, the deeper you dig, the more solid it becomes. And the more you discover the weight of the truth of the Scriptures. Which is why we don't shy away from these difficult things, and we're not going to tonight. A couple of of thoughts about this. The altar of incense... In the holy place or in the holy of holies? Should be in the holy place. Was the writer careless? You know, maybe the pastor just wasn't thinking and and he kind of tripped over his own tongue. You know, maybe his tongue got stuck behind his eye teeth and he couldn't see what he was saying. (laughs) Maybe it's just, you know, the letter got sent off before the Holy Spirit caught the error. I mean, do you see how ridiculous that is? If we truly believe God has inspired scripture, then there must be more to it than just a slip up. Well, a couple of possibilities. Possibility number one. When it says here, having a golden golden altar of incense, some point out that this is not the altar of incense. Then maybe it's not the altar of incense at all. Because that phrase, that word in the, in the Greek, altar of incense, is thumasterion, which means a vessel for burning incense, and it is used in the Septuagint, in that Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, It's used to describe a censer or a fire pan, which the high priest would use to move fire or incense about to different places, but not necessarily the altar of incense itself. Maybe it was just a fire pan for carrying the incense, and that's what's being used here. In fact, in the Septuagint, it's always translated censer. This particular word, there's a different word used to describe the altar of incense In the Old Testament Greek translation. This word is always censer. So maybe it is. Maybe it's just a fire pan. He's saying that inside the Holy of Holies was a fire pan. And and a fire pan was allowed to go in there. In fact, did go in there. Some think the reference here is to the censer that the high priest carried in on Yom Kippur. So one day a year, the Day of Atonement... He went into the Holy of Holies, and the Bible tells us, Leviticus 16, verse 12, He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire, then before the Lord, that a cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, otherwise he will die. So here's one of those stipulations. One of those regulations for the high priest. He didn't just go in there, sprinkle some blood, and get out fast. He had to now carry the fire pan in as well. And sprinkle incense on it. And the incense then went up. And that that small room where the Ark of the Covenant sat would be filled with that sweet incense. And and that, that smoke of the incense would just swirl around. And that was required in Scripture. Now, why did he have to do that? Why take the incense in there on the Day of Atonement? Hold that thought. Now, the problem with this view is that in extra-biblical Greek, the word itself, Thumasterion, is used of any kind of incense altar. So when you get beyond Scripture, the word can be not only censer, but incense altar. It's anything that holds and burns incense. And Philo and Josephus, Josephus himself, Jewish, use this word for the altar of incense. What's the point? Well, the point is that people use this word to describe the altar of incense in the temple. Furthermore, if if this is just a censer and this is not the altar of incense mentioned in verse 4, 
then the pastor would be leaving out the altar of incense altogether. He wouldn't even be mentioning it in the listing of the furniture. And that would be a flaw. So I don't think that's the right answer. The second possibility, which is what I believe, is that this is the altar of incense. That he is describing the actual altar itself as one of the many pieces of furniture. And, get this, it may actually have been, at least in the tabernacle, on the inside of the veil. It's possible that that's exactly where it was, that it wasn't in the holy place, but was actually in the holy of holies, at least at first. Listen to this description, Exodus chapter 30, verse 6. You shall put this altar, the altar of incense, in front of the veil. The word in front of is also translated before. You shall put it before the veil. Now, if you, if it's you and me, or if it's a high priest, and you're walking in before the veil, in front of the veil is as you're walking in. What if you're God? What is before the veil if you're God? What's in front of the veil if you're God? Well, in front would be on the inside, wouldn't it? But he goes on, Exodus 30, verse 6, You shall put this altar in front of the veil that is near the Ark of the Testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the Ark of the Testimony, where I will meet you. Well, that description does sound like perhaps the altar of incense was in front of the Ark. And again, at least for a time, for a season, it was in the Holy of Holies. It's a possibility. I'm not saying that's the way it is, or was, but from the Lord's perspective... That would be before the veil. But Bible students, there's a more important question here. And when you talk about where it is and debate about that, and you've got what the the writer says here in Hebrews, and you've got the Old Testament picture, so which is it? Well, that's hard to totally nail down. But why did God require the cloud of incense to cover the mercy seat on Yom Kippur? Why would he have them if the altar was outside? Why would he have them bring the incense inside and sprinkle it there and have that whole cloud going on? Answer to the question, what does the altar of incense represent? The prayers of the saints. Incense represents prayer. And so you could put it this way, it's the incense of our entrance. Why did the high priest have to have the incense going on in the Holy of Holies? Because that was a moment that was bathed in prayer. That was a moment when the whole room was filled with prayer as he's praying for the people, as all the people are (laughs) praying for him and praying for themselves and lifting up prayer to God. And the incense, that picture, and we see it in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. And I'm not going to go there tonight just to save a little time, but we see that picture. Uh, of the altar of incense in heaven, the heavenly one, the actual one, the original one, and the incense, which is the prayers of the saints mixed in there on that altar, and lightning and thunder comes out of it, and, and things start to really happen, just as God responds to our prayers. Remember, what we're talking about here is not the placement of furniture, we're talking about the right approach to God. And if you approach God through the veil into the heavenly tabernacle, prayer is required. You come communicating. You don't come with a hidden agenda. You don't come with a a negative attitude. You don't come with a, a closed off mind and heart. You come communicating with the Lord. Desiring to fellowship with the Lord because He wants that fellowship with us. So again, with the altar of incense, where is it? I I don't know that it's super necessary that we nail that one down. It's not a course in religious studies. This is about Jesus and the entrance into the perfect heavenly sanctuary. Think again as you're walking in about all the things that you see, especially when you come into the holy place and the holy of holies. Remember the I am statements of Jesus? He said in John 6.35, I am the bread of life, table of showbread. He said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world as the lampstand. He says in John 10, verse 9, I am the door, speaking of the very veil itself. Look quickly over at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. 
I am the door, he says. I'm the veil, he might as well have said. I'm the entrance. And he is how we come into the holiest place. Now, back in chapter 9, the uh, pastor is going to turn to the principal piece of furniture in the Ark of the Co- in, in the tabernacle and the temple, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. Looking at verse 4 again. The Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But, he says, of these things we cannot now speak in detail, although he's just done that, he's just given us a little bit of detail. I think some good detail, and note this, it's the only place we get a description of what was originally in the Ark of the Covenant. Thanks to the Holy Spirit inspiring the Hebrew pastor, we learn these three elements were in there. Golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenants. You could say the jar holding the manna is a picture of God's provision. You say Aaron's rod which budded, a picture of God's authority. The tables of the covenant, a picture of, of God's righteousness in the law. You could also say... The golden jar holding the manna was a picture of Israel's whining and complaining. You could say the Aaron's rod which budded, well, that's a picture of the rebellion of the people. And the Ten Commandments, a picture of something they could not keep. A picture of God's righteousness, a picture of man's failure. But all three of these things were inside the Ark of the Covenant. What's interesting is by the time that the Ark was set in Solomon's temple, it only contained the stone tablets of the law. Now, how do you know that? 1 Kings 8, verse 9, there was nothing in the Ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put in there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. By the time it's coming in there, only the tablets are there. The other aspects are not. But, Delich says this almost seems to imply that the other things, Aaron's rod and the manna, had been there formerly. But now, they're not there. Now, I'm telling you all this for a reason. The, 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 the ark, the, the uh, altar of incense, where does that go? And what's inside the ark? Well, there was at one time all three of these things. Now there's just the table of the covenant. And there's some confusion about things going on in there. Keep this all in mind. The ark itself completely disappears from from human view after the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C. No more ark. Did you know in the second temple there was no ark of the covenant? It was not placed in there at all. In fact, in 63 B.C., the Roman general Pompey forced his way into the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem. And to his surprise, he found the Holy of Holies an empty room. So after the destruction of the temple, and there's all kinds of stories, and I've actually gone over a few of those, stories as to where the ark might be. You know, archaeologists have said, we saw it there. You know, I mean, as far away as, as Ireland, people have guessed. Or down in Ethiopia, perhaps. Or hidden in some dark chamber beneath the Temple Mount today. But it's not there. It wasn't there in the second temple at all. Here's my point. And I think something that the pastor is hinting at. All of these divine regulations. Read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All of the specifications. This is how it must be. This is where I will meet with you. This is the procedure for doing it correctly. This is how you approach righteously. Regulations of divine worship, (laughs) indeed. Look at what Israel did. Furniture got moved. Contents disrupted. Items displaced or disappearing altogether. And it really makes you wonder. How did God put up with this people? Why would he put up with that? How, how could he accept such temple fooling around? Such a mess of things. In fact, entire seasons where the temple itself fell into disrepair and no one was even offering sacrifices. And yet God was still the God of Israel. And you would think by reading the law, man, if you violate the slightest tenet of this law, he's going to just smash you. 
You're just going to be wiped out. And yet for all of Israel's rebellions and lapses, God still interacted with them, still sent the prophets to them. Not over days or months or years, but over decades, over centuries. He continued to send his servants to them to give them opportunity to repent, to call them back to him over and over. The system of divine worship in the earthly tabernacle and later in the temples was completely insufficient because the people were insufficient to do one thing that God asked them to do. And as we know from Romans chapter 5, that's why the law was given, so the sin would increase. Not so that God would recognize their sin, but so that the people would. And yet through all of this, incense was offered. Prayer was still called for. Communication was still at the heart of the entrance into the holy place and the holy of holies. And God's chesed was great. Chesed, that Hebrew word for grace, for long suffering. It's, it's grace and patience and mercy all wrapped into one word. And what we see in all of this history with Israel is a God of abject grace. Of amazing grace. A God who put up with the people. A God who described himself this way. Exodus 34 verse 6. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. That godly description is literally repeated eight times in the Hebrew scriptures. Listen to it again. The Lord God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. That's why he put up with the mess. I'll tell you what, when I walk into my living room and the, and the furniture is messed up, I'm not happy about it. Who moved my chair? Why is there a fruit roll-up on my couch? It's funny, everything becomes mine. Where is my TV remote? And the kids come in and do I have it right here. That's mine. I just let you borrow it. And all this stuff going on in the tabernacle and then in the temples and the mess that they made. And God still came to them, still sent the prophets, still showed grace. Now, when these things have been so prepared, verse six, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second that is the Holy of Holies, only the high priest enters once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Colossians 2.17 again tells us things which are a mere shadow of what's, of what's to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All of this was a shadowy picture. We talked about Sunday and last Wednesday night. The tabernacle, the temple, the regulations, the stipulations, the law, the rules, the approach to God. All of it was a picture that you don't just come walking up to God wearing whatever you want, acting however you want, and just say, dude, let me in. There's a way in. There's a right way, a perfect way, a correct way. Now, we right now, we know that's Jesus. But all of this was God historically laying a foundation and setting a path and developing a pattern that people would come to understand what all of this was about. It's interesting. He, he makes a comment here in verse 10. These things related only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So this was a temporary setup, though it lasted over a thousand years. It was a temporary setup that was pointing at the true reality. Until the time of Reformation. That word Reformation is diorthosis in the, in the Greek, and it's a medical term. The time of Reformation, the medical term that means to restore or straighten, as in broken bones. 
The old covenant and all that he's described here was as insufficient for healing a broken bone as a band-aid. That's all it was. It was a temporary wrap. I remember one time years ago, and I told this story before, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I cut my hand wide open. The palm of my hand, cut it open on, on literally on a lamp that we had in the living room that had a, a leaf pattern on it. It was really sharp metal, and I, I tripped and fell and caught my hand on it. It was just weird how it happened. Blood going everywhere. I didn't sit there and stitch up my hand. Okay, I grabbed a towel and wrapped it until I could get to the emergency room. The old law, the old covenant, all of these stipulations were a band-aid to get you to the place of reformation. Because the reformation, the healing, the straightening of the broken bone, or more accurately, of the broken heart, is Jesus Christ, the great physician. And He's the one who brings the healing that we need. He brings the reformation of brokenness. And what we need more than anything else is a reformation, not of the bones, but of the heart. Notice this in verse 9. He made a comment. He said, these are things which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. That's interesting. They can't make you perfect in conscience, which means for all of the regulations and all the pomp and the circumstance and the holiness, you would come up to temple with your sacrifice and doing all the right things, but you always would walk away knowing you really weren't clean. You really weren't. To be a Jewish man and come out of the temple and glance sideways at a woman walking the other direction and realizing, <laughs> where are my eyes going? And I just offered a lamb. I just gave sacrifice. I just went through all the rigmarole of going in and out of the temple and I still can't keep my eyes fixed on the Lord. Because none of that stuff cleans or cleansed the conscience. None of it could heal the heart. It was insufficient. So, enter Jesus. Part two, and the sufficiency of the heavenly Savior. The sufficiency of the heavenly Savior. Verse 11. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Having obtained is in the aorist tense, which means it happened in the past, but it's continuing to this day. Having obtained, he did what was necessary, and in that moment, by his blood, eternal redemption was available to all, but it continues to this very day. That saving, that cleansing blood of Jesus. Now, because of these couple of verses, there are those who say Jesus actually, after his resurrection and ascension, when he came into the heavenly tabernacle to complete the work of, of redemption, he had to actually sprinkle blood, his blood, in the heavenly tabernacle. Some of you have heard that teaching. I disagree. In fact, I can show you where I believe, while that sounds nice, it's actually not biblical. Why would you say that? Well, because it's in my notes. <laughs> Listen, Jesus on the cross said, Tetelestai. It is finished. He used the most complete word you could use in the Greek. It is done. Here and now, finished. Right here, right now. No more sprinkling. No more. He, he didn't have to then come up there. In fact, if you note in the passage we just read in those verses, it doesn't say that he came in and sprinkled the blood. Nowhere says that he came in and sprinkled his blood in heaven. Now some have surmised, well, but he had to to cleanse even heavenly things. No, that's not what the scriptures say. And there's an important reason why we should understand this that I'll bring you to in just a minute. But look at verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify from the cleansing of the flesh or for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Note what he just said. Cleanse your conscience. 
back in verse 9, these things cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. But now, Jesus does what's necessary to cleanse the conscience. Conscience there is a word that means awareness of or sensitivity to righteousness. He cleanses that aspect of us that, that understands right from wrong, that sees right from wrong. The whole inward sense of guilt or shame cannot be made right by ceremony or ritual. It never works. Shame is only taken away when I look into the eyes of a gracious Jesus. That's when suddenly the guilt is removed. When I look to Him. Now, check this out. Keep your finger here and I want you to go all the way back to Numbers chapter 19. Numbers 19. So important. What's up with the ashes of the of the heifer? You know, he mentions here the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer. Well, we know about the goats and bulls. They were part of the sacrifices that were ongoing. The ashes of the heifer is an interesting one. It's a little bit different. Follow this with me. Numbers chapter, did I say chapter 9? 19. We want to be in 19, beginning in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, that they bring you an unblemished red heifer, in which is no defect, and on which a yoke has never been placed. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest. Now, Eleazar is Aaron's son. And it shall be brought outside the camp and be slaughtered in his presence. Next, Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, its refuse shall be burned. The priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet material and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. The priest shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and afterward come into the camp, but the priest shall be unclean until evening. The one who burns it shall also wash his clothes in water and bathe his body in water and shall be unclean until evening. Now a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. And the congregation of the sons of Israel shall keep it as water to remove impurity. It is purification from sin. It's an interesting sacrifice, an an interesting, strange offering. But it was used, these, these ashes of the red heifer literally were kept. And water for purification, they would use these ashes. Do you know that over a thousand years of Israel's history, doing this process that they only sacrificed about nine red heifers over a thousand years because they kept the ashes. And every time, in fact, the rabbis would tell you that the ashes of the first red heifer are still there because they would take the ashes of the second and mix it in with the first and and continue to use it. And then the ashes of the third they mixed in. And they always had these ashes that they could mix together with water to use for purification from sin. But it's different than all the others. This, this red heifer had to be spotless because it was about sin removal. So it had to speak of complete purity. Spotless, by the way, means that it could have no more than three hairs that were not red. Have, have you noticed in the news every now and then it comes up, a red heifer has been found in New Mexico. In fact, the most recent one, I think, was in 2015 found in Baja. So I don't know if the Landises are down there with the red heifer taking care of that for us. But it has to be a legitimate red heifer. It can't even have one white or gray hair. I guess it could have one. It couldn't have more than three. That, that's the rule. At least that's, that's the rabbi's rule. I think by the biblical standard, it couldn't have any. It had to be completely red-haired all the way through, and it's still a big deal in Israel today. Here's the point, though. The red heifer was not about the red heifer any more than any of these regulations were about the regulations. They were about Jesus. The red heifer had to be unblemished with no defect as Jesus was. 
had to be a, a beast of burden on which a yoke had never been placed. Hey, Jesus was never driven. He was never under a yoke. He was never forced. He was never manipulated. Jesus functioned of his own will and authority. He said in John 10, 17, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life so I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. Jesus did not move under a yoke. He moved under complete freedom and obedience to the Father. The red heifer was the only sacrifice that was sacrificed outside of the camp. All the rest were inside there in the tab- the court of the tabernacle. Red heifer was done outside of the camp just as Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. Golgotha to the north. John nineteen seventeen. they took Jesus therefore and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And again, that's out the horse gate or today the Damascus gate of the old city and to the north of Israel or, or of Jerusalem outside the camp. The red heifer was the only sacrifice that was not done by the priest. Note that in in Numbers 19, it says Eliezer was to be present, but not to actually offer the sacrifice in the same way that Caiaphas was present, but didn't actually offer the sacrifice of Jesus. The picture just continues. The red heifer was burned, hide, flesh, and blood completely, 100%. Well, Jesus took on the full fiery wrath of God. Every aspect of the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus in his sacrifice. Romans 5, 9 says, Having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. And then there's this weird thing about cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet material. You throw that in there and you burn it with the ashes or with the red heifer. Why? Cedar wood, a picture of the cross. Scarlet, a reminder of the blood of Jesus. Jesus. And hyssop... Hyssop is that unique branch that fulfilled this Numbers 19 prophecy. You shall use hyssop. John wrote in John 19, 28, To fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Where in the prophetic scripture does it say that the Messiah is going to say, I'm thirsty? It doesn't. But Jesus said, I'm thirsty, so that this scripture would be fulfilled. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, and they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop. And they brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, to die. It's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And the work in that moment was done. The sacrifice offered, the redemption paid in full. And it's an amazing picture. But the sacrifice of the red heifer was about purification of sin. That's the point of the whole thing. A picture of the purification of sin. And if the blood of a red heifer could exemplify this, Hebrews 9.14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's a profound Truth and statement here. He's making such a point that the blood of bulls and goats and even the ashes of the heifer that was supposed to be purification from sin could only cleanse for ceremony but could not cleanse the conscience. Christ's blood is what cleanses the conscience. Now I said that the sprinkling of Christ's blood didn't happen in the heavenly tabernacle. Here's why this is so important. There is only one place in the New Testament where the sprinkled blood of Jesus is ever applied. Look up every verse having to do with his blood being sprinkled. And the application is only and always on the human heart. Nothing else. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Peter writes to those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. And remember where we landed on Sunday? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, 
Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills and the spirit gives life. Now, why am I bringing up that verse? Listen, servants of the new covenant. We can only truly serve God from a clean conscience. You cannot serve God if your conscience isn't clean. Why not? Listen, if if I come before God and my conscience is guilt-ridden or shameful, then every act of service that I offer to God, I offer for myself. I'm offering to try and clean myself up. I'm trying to earn my adequacy. I feel ashamed, so I'm going to do something good, and that makes me feel like maybe a little less shameful than I was before. And so I'm out there trying to satisfy the requirements of redemption. Hey, the requirements of your redemption and mine were finished at Calvary. Done. And recognizing that purifies my conscience and now allows me to serve God for His sake, not for mine. I'm not a servant of the new covenant so I can prove myself to God. I'm a servant of the new covenant because he has proven his love for me. And so that every act of service I do is now for him. Otherwise, my friends, listen, it's all an endless search for a sacred cow. That's all it really is. I'm trying to get my act together. And year after year, you're just looking for the red heifer that's spotless and you will never find it. And even when that red heifer is found in Israel, it still doesn't purify for sin. The people still had a conscience problem. Verse 15. For this reason, he, that is Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, and note this, the word... We talked about Sunday, diathike, testament or will. Where a will is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant or a will is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. The new covenant is not a two-party agreement. It is a one-party testament. It is the last and only testament of Jesus Christ. It's his will. And you know what that means. There's a knock on your door. You open the door. Man is standing there, a courier, and he's got a manila envelope. And on the manila envelope, it says the law offices of someone and somewhat. And you take the envelope and you're thinking, what is this all about? And you open it up and it's a will. What does that mean to you? It means you've got an inheritance. It means now something is coming your way. Somebody died and has left something to you. Hey, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why? To obtain an eternal inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, that will not fade, fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And that inheritance was enacted by his death for eternal life. Verse 18, therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of the goats, goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself, that is the law, and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you, Exodus 24, verse 8. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. According to the law, one may may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And he's right on the cusp of quoting Leviticus 17, 11, which reads... For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. There must be the blood. 
I think I shared recently that Leviticus is the bloodiest book in the Bible. I, I didn't expect that coming to it, but the first seven chapters are all about sacrifice. And then coming into chapter 17, verse 11, that's the key verse of the entire book of Leviticus. It is a verse, a book that is just blood and more blood and more blood beyond that. A bloody book. And the whole point that that book shows us of the perpetual sacrifices was to prepare us to fully grasp the blood of Christ and what his blood would truly mean. Therefore, verse 23, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, that is with blood. But the heavenly things themselves with, note this, better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often. As the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, you know, those, the last several verses, and we've, we've read a lot of verses here. And as I was going through this, I kept thinking, well, I could piece this out or pull that out. Listen, he is making the point. In fact, I really don't think he needs my help. He is making the point here that it is the blood of Jesus that does it all, that accomplished it all, that bought our inheritance, that opened the way into the heavenly realm. And it was blood that was offered once. That word once, we've already seen a couple of times here in Hebrews. It's always once for all. It's an absolute. You don't do it again. It's a one-time deal. And the point is clear that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is not perpetual. It is not continual. It is not transubstantiated from mass to mass by the wafer and the wine, as our Catholic friends would teach. But that, that's, that's at the core, truly, of Catholicism and the Catholic Mass. It all surrounds the Eucharist which is that word Eucharisteo, which simply means thanksgiving. It all surrounds the Eucharist. And the idea by transubstantiation, which came about, oh, I think it was about a thousand years after Christ, one of the popes said, "Let's, let's do this. It was not taught before then. Transubstantiation, that is, you take the wafer, and when it hits your tongue, it mysteriously becomes the flesh of Jesus. And then as you drink of the wine, which isn't even allowed in most Catholic churches today, the priest does that, which is an alcohol problem, but let's not go there. The drinking of the wine becomes, as it goes down your throat, the blood, literal blood of Jesus, transubstantiation. And the idea is that there's an ongoing suffering of Christ, an ongoing re-crucifying again and again in the Mass. But my friends, the Hebrew writer is clear, the sufferings of Christ are not ongoing. The sufferings of Jesus, you've heard him called a man of sorrow, right? Not anymore. He is no longer the man of sorrows. He was the man of sorrows in the flesh. After the resurrection, what is he? He is the God of glory. He is not the one who is continually suffering. He is continually now worshipped. That's perpetual. The glory of Jesus Christ. Peter said in 1 Peter 1.10, The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or what time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating, as he predicted, listen, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Jesus Christ is not suffering any longer. He is glorified. He is not still dying. He's not still up on the cross. The crucifix is a misnomer. He is no longer on the cross. Now, I will say this, where our Catholic friends would wrongly, by their theology, overstate the meaning of the Eucharist. On the other hand... Evangelical theology sadly understates it. Now this is just 
one man's opinion. But the fact that communion is not celebrated continually and often is sad to me. In many churches, they say, well, we do it once a year. Why only once a year? Why wouldn't you do it as often as you do this? Do so in remembrance of me, Jesus said. And we see them doing it on the first day of the week in the New Testament church. And it was a perpetual, not moment of sorrow, not moment of being bummed, not saying, oh, Jesus, you're still on the cross. No, a perpetual celebration of the new covenant. Because Jesus' death enacted that. We take communion, and in communion, we honor his death, we worship his life, and we celebrate our inheritance. And that we do continually. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I told you on Sunday, we are proclaiming inheritance. He died, but we got the inheritance. And it's reserved in heaven for us. Verse 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, judgment. So Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without sin to those who eagerly await Him. One thing really quick, your Bible may say without reference to sin, and that's because the translators are trying to soften the sound of it, that He's going to appear without sin, because the translators don't want to imply that Jesus had sin. You know what? He did. He did. Jesus was a sinner among sinners. What are you saying, Rick? He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He became sin on the cross. He embodied sin on the cross. And so the first time He came, that's why He came. To wear our sin and to kill it. So the next time He comes, He will appear a second time for salvation without sin. Sin is not the deal when He comes the second time. You know what is? Salvation for those who eagerly await Him. Judgment for those who don't. This is a serious verse. In fact, verse 28 is the only thing that makes verse 27 palatable. Listen to verse 27 all by itself. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this judgment... And you know what? That is where the entirety of the lost world lives. That's where lost friends and family, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, dear ones to you and to me, that's where they live, in the place that after death comes judgment. What a terrifying place to live. No wonder people don't want to talk about it. No wonder people shy away from conversations about Jesus Christ when you bring them up because they think after death comes judgment and I don't want that. I don't want to think about that. It's terrifying. Well, they need to hear verse 28. That He was offered once to bear the sins of many. He'll appear for salvation without sin. Sin's not the issue. Salvation is the issue. All you got to do is eagerly await Him. Look forward to Him. Love Him. But people stop in verse 27. And it's the place where, again, where lost people live. But Jesus died once. And by the way, those who say, and I've had this argument, it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so everybody has to die. Enoch, who never died, is going to have to die. In fact, that verse has been used as an argument for Enoch being one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. If you're not tracking with me on this, don't worry, just ask me later, I'll explain. But Revelation 11 shows two witnesses. And I think it's pretty obvious that it's Moses and Elijah. We'll talk about that when we get to Revelation. But I've had people say, no, it's got to be Enoch and Elijah. Because Enoch didn't die, and Elijah didn't die, and it's appointed for men to die once, and then judgment. you got to die. No. No, no. There's going to be an entire population of people who will never taste death. Who will never die. Who, like Enoch and like Elijah, now Elijah may taste death because if he's one of the two witnesses, both the witnesses are going to have to die. 
but a whole host of people who, like Enoch, will never die. And I am praying to be in that camp. We're talking about the rapture of the church. We're talking about Jesus saying in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So yes, it is appointed for people to die and then comes judgment unless, unless you're born again. And now there's a whole new option out there for you. Oh, I'm not saying you may not die. I'm not saying that we may, uh, that I may skirt death. I may end up dying and if I do, I'll just be in the rapture before anyone else. You know, I'll be part of the first group going up. But the reality is this isn't an ironclad statement. It is the sacrifice of Jesus that brings salvation and completely removes all fear of death. 100%. So we don't worry about it. If I die, I'll be raised up in the rapture. If I'm alive, I will never die. Either way, sounds really good to me. Part 3. I think you guys can handle it. Hang with me because it's part of the whole here. Part three is what I would call the soma of our perfect sanctification. Now I want to say two things for you. Number one, if you took a nap, wake up, pay attention. Number two, if you're nodding at all, go out and get some coffee because you do not want to miss this. The soma of our perfect sanctification. Soma, S-O-M-A. It's the word in the Greek for body. Watch this, verse 1, chapter 10. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Is everybody clear on that? We all get that by now? Because he's repeated it now several times, that the old law is insufficient. That's the bottom line here. Verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible, underscore that, impossible, the Greek word for impossible means impossible, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It can't work. So why do we do this? Why do we keep doing what they did? What do you mean, Rick? We keep going back to our own sacrificial systems. We keep playing the same game. They went up to temple. They brought the sacrifice. The doves, the pigeons, the bulls, the goats, the lambs, the rams. They brought it all year after year, month after month. month. They brought the meal offerings, the drink offerings. They kept doing it over and over. And we do the same thing when we say, Did I pray enough today? Did I, did I go to enough you know, church events this month? Am I holy enough? Have I made it today? I missed church last week. I haven't been in six months. You know, and then, of course, it just rolls on because now I feel guilty that I haven't been to church so I can't go to church. Stupid! I'm not saying any of you all are stupid, please. I'm not calling anyone a moron tonight. <laughs> but this whole idea, did I read the Bible enough today? Did I memorize, memorize enough verses? Did I serve enough today? You're in the sacrificial system. And you're just spinning out sacrifices that cannot save you. Don't do that. Well, so what am I supposed to do? Just ignore the whole thing? No. What you're supposed to do is love Jesus who already saved you from all the rest of the stuff. Be in relationship with Him. It's not, oh God, forgive me because it's been so long since I prayed, but God, I can't wait to talk to you. You got a minute? (laughs) I want to have a conversation with you. I want to be where you are. This is why I said earlier, we can only truly serve God from a clean conscience. And a clean conscience is blood bought by Jesus, not by you, not by me. You go to counseling to try to get a clean conscience, it will never work. It is only in Jesus. And when the conscience is clean, then I am out of the cycle of self-sacrifice. But we slip back into the self-sacrifice for our own sin when our life is about what we're doing instead of about what He has done. Verse 5, watch this. Therefore, therefore, when He comes into the world, He says... 
sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. That Greek word soma. A body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And I'll just tell you all, verses 5, 6, and 7 ought to be in red letters. Because that's Jesus speaking. I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Now, listen, this is another marvelous psalm of Davidic eavesdropping. David writing the psalm, overhearing father and son in a conversation that some think was on the eve of the incarnation. Can you even imagine the conversation of Jesus and the father? Before the Holy Spirit came to Mary and she became pregnant, father and son talking and and Jesus saying, Behold, you have prepared a body for me. You're fashioning a human body for me, Father. And I am going to wear it and I have come to do your will. And this conversation, marvelous. Let me read it to you exactly. This is from Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice. And and by the way, just look at your verse there in the Hebrew Scripture and listen. Because I need you to see a little difference. Psalm 40, verse 6 says, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Okay, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. So here, but a body you have prepared for me. There, it says, My ears you have opened. So it's one of those, What's going on here? This is not what was said originally. And I know what some of you are thinking. Ah. Septuagint, right? It's the Greek translation. That's why there's a difference. Not here. In fact, here, both the Old Testament, both the Hebrew Scriptures from the original Hebrew and the Greek translation, both translate Psalm 40, verse 6, My ears you have opened. Or, or my ears you have dug out. Or literally, my ears you have Made. Now, one thing, just on the surface, the point is obedience. Whether you're listening to God or, or you're, you're putting on the body that is made for you, the, the point is that he was obedient to do the will of God, and that in the scroll of the book it's written about Jesus. So that's the, that's the big picture point here, but it still leaves us wondering, well, what about this? What about this idea that one is my ears you have opened And one is a body you have prepared for me. What the language portrays there, and I'm talking about in the Old Testament, my ears you have opened, my ears you have dug out, my ears you have made, all three translations are equally good. The language portrays the creation or the creative work of God. Literally, you fashioned my ears. Picture God with a little auger poking a hole in a skull because an ear is going to go there. You know, as Psalm 139, verse 13 talks about, we are woven together in our mother's womb. And David says, behold, you knit me together. You wove me in my mother's womb. And here, that's the picture. That's, that's what's being described. Even in saying, my ears you have opened, in the psalm, he's not saying, oh, I hear you better now. Thanks for clearing the clog. What he's saying is, you fashioned my ears so that I could hear you and obey. You created my ability to hear and obey you. That's, that's what the psalm is saying. So the picture is a picture of creation. Think about this again. God wove the body of Christ together in his mother's womb. Ears, arms, feet, eyes. God prepared, literally prepared, a body for Jesus. And ears are just part of the whole. Ears are just a picture, a a part of the creative process described in Psalm 40. And so the author here, who's the author of Hebrews? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. Thank you. 
The author here takes it to its, un, to, it, to its natural conclusion. It's not just ears that were created. It was an entire body that was created for obedience. And we have to allow for the Holy Spirit to make changes that more clarify what was being said and what was being intended here. And I will add this. There is some evidence that the original Hebrew text, that is going back earlier than the oldest Hebrew text we have, and going back earlier even than the Septuagint itself, there is indication that the Hebrew text actually may have said body. That my a body you have prepared rather than ears you have created or formed or dug for me. The idea again though is that ears were symbolic in creation of the entire formation of the body. Are you with me? Either way, it points to obedience. Isaiah 50 verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with the word. This is Jesus speaking. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. He goes on to say, I was one who had my beard plucked out. I was so obedient to the Father. Revelation 3, 22, speaking of obedience. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But there is another reason here. I think what's going on here is that the Holy Spirit is working in the mediums of Greek and Hebrew language. Hebrew language being concrete, Greek language being abstract, and he's using both colors on the palette to get the point across to us, to bring understanding of what is going on here. And this is what's remarkable to me. The word, the Hebrew word that means to open, or to dig, or to fashion, my ears you have opened, my ears you have dug, the word is kara. The Hebrew word kara is also translated pierced. Pierced. A body you have pierced for me. A body you have prepared for me. Now, every Hebrew slave was set free after six years. In the seventh year, they were allowed to be set free. It didn't matter what the reason was that they went into slavery. Usually it was because of debt. If you went into slavery because of debt, after six years, automatically you were required to be set free. Unless, Exodus 21, verse 5, the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children. I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God. He shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. The point I'm making, and I believe that the pastor is driving to, is simply this. That the body was prepared for Jesus for one specific purpose, and it was to be pierced. Behold, a body you have prepared for me. Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. That is all the sacrifices, all the blood, all that came before. It's written of me. It's pointing to me. My body you prepared that would be pierced on the cross to fulfill all that is written here. And Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. Zechariah 12.10, They will look on me whom they have pierced. And John 19.36 tells us of the crucifixion that these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture that says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. And the scroll of the book was written, beginning to end to unveil this truth about Jesus Christ. A body to be pierced. Now read on. After saying above, sacrifices and whole burnt offerings, verse 8, and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, that's the old covenant, in order to establish the second, that's the new covenant. And by this, that is by the obedience of Jesus, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. 
We will have been sanctified by the servant obedience of Jesus. And verse 11, he says, hey, every high priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, Psalm 110, verse 1, waiting from that time forward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet, Psalm 110, also verse 1. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And that is a stunning verse. Because what he says here is the dynamic of the soma, the body of Christ, which we are, by the way. We are the body. The body you have prepared for me. A body that would be pierced so that we could and would become the body of Christ. Here's the dynamic of the body of Christ. What he says in verse 14 is stunning. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Think about that. What is that? We have been perfected. That is teleo. Same, the root word of tetelestai, it is finished, we are finished, we're done, we're perfect. The work has been done, we have been perfected, it's in the perfect tense, which means it's a precise point in time. On the cross when he said tetelestai, you were perfected instantaneously in that moment. Well, I don't feel perfect. No, that's because you are being sanctified. Both have taken place. Sanctified is hagiazo. It's where that word hagias, holy ones. We are being made holy. That's in the present tense, which means it's continuous action. So here's the marvelous work of God. Here's grace at work. The moment you step into a relationship with Jesus by faith, you're perfect. In God's eyes, saved, seated at the right hand of the Father. You are seated in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. It's done. You're saved. You're perfect. And you are now in the process of being sanctified for the rest of your life. I love that. Grace that saves me, perfects me, and also allows me to recognize God ain't finished with me yet. He is still at work. I've got to add this real quickly to you all because this, this is a continuing issue that I see come up over and over and over in the church. I see it coming up in my life from time to time. And it's the issue that I have, I am being made in my life to accomplish something. To do something. That, that's why I'm here. I gotta have my grand moment. I, I've gotta, I'll, I'll get to that point. It's gonna be an apex. And here I go and I'm gonna land there and, and, and ask people who are retired, how do you feel? Did you ever get to the apex? Did you ever hit the grand moment? Now some might say, well, you know, I, I did run a large business. That was successful. Others might say, well, I had record album sales. That was successful. Someone else might say, well, I I traveled the world. You know, I finished everything on my bucket list. Yeah, but did you ever have the big moment? Listen, in the church, we have this thinking that we've got to get to a point where we can do something. That we're being prepared in this life to do something. You know what? You are being prepared in this life to do something in the next. In the kingdom age, this is one of the wonders of the millennial kingdom. All the pre- You may never do anything in your life. How's that? How's that feel? You may get all the way to your deathbed and be lying there going, I accomplished nothing. Never mowed the lawn. Never vacuumed the house. I never served in any important ministry. I never had any great success. I never did. I still have a flip phone. I said I wasn't going to go there. (laughs) Do you know how ridiculous we are? We are striving and fighting for that big moment that we're going to achieve all of our dreams. And it's impossible. It will not happen in this life. When you are perfected instantaneously by Jesus, you are being sanctified. Why? Because you are going to be a servant in the kingdom. You are going to be a priest. You are going to rule and reign with him. You're going to have such a role you can't even imagine. I'm going to be, you know, 
Ooh, senior pastor of a church. Big deal. That has nothing on being a servant in the coming kingdom. That's what we're being prepared for. Your entire life is preparation. So you can retire from a job, that's fine, but you ain't finished yet. And as long as we're drawing breath, though we have been made perfect, we are being sanctified for that age and for the coming of eternity. And that, my friends, that's where you're going to shine. That's when it'll happen. Man. Seated in the heavenly places with Christ, we have been made perfect. We are being cleansed. We're still being cleansed by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, Ephesians 5, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind. I will write them. Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. He then says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. We read that on Sunday morning. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. We're not playing that old game. We're not going back to those self-sacrificial offerings. We have been perfected. And we are being sanctified. What does he mean in verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us? You know what he means. What do you mean? I mean, you know. You know that you know that you know. Servants of the new covenant, get this. You know him. The Holy Spirit testifies this reality to you. You know Jesus. You know Him. You know Him. I I can't say that enough. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. How do you know you're saved? How do you know you're a follower of Jesus? Because He's telling you you are. How do you know that you know Him? Because He tells you you know Him. And that's what He meant back in in Hebrews 8, 11. And I brushed by this on Sunday morning. They shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me from the smallest to the greatest of them. All will know me. You know me. He would say to you right now tonight, You know me. Hebrews 8, verse 11 is not a future tense promise for you. It is right now. You know the Lord. Which is why it's the one question you never hear in the body of Christ. It's the one question that we never ask one another among servants of the new covenant. We don't walk up to each other. I don't say, Glenn, do you know Jesus? I don't say, Susie, do you know him? Hillary, do you know? Have I ever asked you if you know Jesus? She's on staff and I haven't asked her that question. Why? Because she knows him. And she knows she knows him. And I know she knows Him because I know Him. I'm not asking you tonight, do you know Jesus? Of course you do. You know the groom. So now, all we're doing is getting ready for the wedding. 